The presidents of China, Xi Jinping, and Brazil, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, signed several agreements on bilateral relations to enhance economic cooperation. In France, Constitutional Council, which will rule on the constitutionality of the pension reform forced through the President Emmanuel Macron, as authorities expect more and stronger protests against the bill. In Yemen, the Ansarullah movement and the Arab coalition led by Saudi Arabia started a prisoner swap as part of the negotiation process to end the conflict. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, and this are the news. On Friday, the presidents of China, Xi Jinping, and Brazil, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, signed several agreements on bilateral relations to enhance economic cooperation. The agreements cover a variety of areas, such as tourism, food, environment, science and technology, aerospace, finance, among others. As part of his talks with his Chinese counterpart, Lula called for the creation of financial mechanisms outside the dollar area to counteract organizations that grant extortionate loans to developing countries. As part of his agenda, the Brazilian head of state intends to propose a plan for a peaceful solution to the conflict in Ukraine, as Brazil is a neutral country on the conflict. Lula's visit to China, the third one as the president of Brazil and the first during his current term, precedes the 15th meeting of the BRICS group made up by Brazil, China, India and Russia to be held in August 2023, which according to Lula will see the return of Brazil to the current economic and political panorama. Also on Friday, and as part of his official visit, Lula paid homage to the Chinese martyrs with a floral tribute at the Monument of to the People's Heroes in Beijing, accompanied by Chinese and Brazilian officials, fulfilling one of his first commitments. The Monument to the People's Heroes is a 10-story obelisk that has, was erected as a national monument of China to the martyrs of the revolutionary struggle during the 19th and 20th centuries, and is a piece of the Tiananmen Square in Beijing, in front of the mausoleum of Mao Zedong. Priorly on Thursday, Lula also attended the inauguration ceremony of the former Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff as president of the BRICS Development Bank. To conclude his agenda in China, both presidents will hold a gift exchange ceremony and an official dinner. We move on to other topics. In Venezuela, revolutionary forces commemorated the 21st anniversary of the popular victory against the coup d'etat carried out against the government of President Hugo Chavez. The mobilization was led by Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro. During his speech, the president commemorated the actions of the Venezuelan people during the events of April 11th, 12th and 13th, 2002, stating that it was the civil military police union that wrote one of the most glorious chapters in the history of the country. At the same time, President Maduro called on the citizens to continue leading the revolutionary process and strengthen the popular organization in the fight against corruption. Because if it is true that they are bombarding us with sanctions, that they have created gigantic holes in our country with sanctions, it is also true that they have stabbed us with the betrayal of corruption. Banditry and the emergence of mafias that have stolen the wealth of the people stabbing us in the back. They're nothing but a bunch of traitors and corrupted mercenaries, and there must be justice and an iron fist. Whoever falls against all mafias, in this context, the Venezuelan president called on the people to form a new April 13th and to remain together and united in the fight against corruption. 21 years ago, we were able to achieve an unprecedented miracle. We were able to defeat an international oligarchic coup d'etat. 
We were able to mobilize six or seven million Venezuelans. They went to the streets and the armed forces joined the people on the streets. We rescued our commander Hugo Chavez alive. He had been taken, he had been kidnapped. They tried to kill him, but our Lord Jesus Christ saved him and saved his life so he could be in charge of the country all the years he had left. We were capable of accomplishing that miracle on April the 13th against an oligarchic coup d'etat. I call Venezuela to a new April the 13th against corruption, against bureaucracy, against the mafia, and against the groups that betray the people. During the event, the Venezuelan president stressed that the Venezuelan people are solid and independent and will not accept threats from the U.S. government. Yesterday, a U.S. spokesman came out to threaten Venezuela. He came out to say that if Venezuela does not make progress in the political dialogues with the sold-out, corrupted mercenaries from the United Platform, they will take repressals and they will impose new sanctions against our country. I told the U.S. spokesman to go to hell because people need to respect Venezuela. We don't accept threats from the United States government. We are here on our own and we will continue to advance on our own. Now we move on to other topics. The head of the UN verification mission for the peace process in Colombia, Carlos Ruiz Maso, called for progress in the comprehensive implementation of the peace accords and called for the de-escalation of the conflict through dialogue. Carlos Ruiz Maso made the statement during the presentation of the most recent report on the peace process in Colombia before the UN Security Council. The document covers the period from December 27, 2022 to March 26, 2023. The delegate highlighted the advances in issues that are part of the agreements, such as the integral rural reform and the ethnic chapter, as well as the security guarantees for the signatories of the peace agreements. RIS recognized the importance of the total peace policy promoted by the current Colombian government, going hand in hand with the promotion of dialogues with army groups to broaden the scope of this process in the country. The recent meeting of Mr. Londoño in Bogota, as well as the joint visit to the former territorial area for training and reintegration in Mesetas in Meta Department, in the wake of a serious threat by an illegal armed group against dozens of former combatants and their families, are an example of how the parties can work together to address the multiple challenges facing the process and to advance implementation. And the Cuban president, Miguel Diaz Canel Bermudez, visits major steel factory Antillana de Acero and verifies the progress of its important investment project. The Cuban president visited the steel factory on Thursday, where one of the most important investment processes in the country is being carried out. Diaz Canel informed on Twitter that the facility, known as the Factory of Factories, is being modernized with Russian government credit of more than $100 million. The president praised the progress of the investment, which has changed completely the conditions of the factory five years into its modernization works and sentence that Antillana Acero will soon be contributing to the nation's economy. Let's take a short break. But first, remember you can follow us on our TikTok at Telesur English, in which you will be able to see news in different formats, news updates, and more. Other stories coming up. Stay with us.
Welcome back. On Friday, the French remain expectant ahead of the imminent decision of the nine members of the Constitutional Council, which will rule on whether the popular or the unpopular pension reform is totally or partially valid, or if it must be censored. The Constitutional Council will determine whether the reform complies with the principles of the French Magna Carta, in addition to ruling on whether or not to call a referendum on popular initiative on the ruling posed by President Emmanuel Macron. Meanwhile, a day of tension is expected in the streets and security forces are already deployed in several landmark locations. On the eve of the 13th day of protests against the pension reform, crowds gathered in different parts of the country. On Thursday, the U.S. President Joe Biden, during a visit in Ireland, said he is not concerned about the leak of highly sensitive U.S. government documents related to the Ukraine war and the U.S. allies amid an investigation into the matter. We got to move. I'm not concerned about the leaking news, and I'm concerned that it happened. But there's nothing contemporaneous that I'm aware of that is of great consequence. Are you concerned? <laughs> Now we move on to other topics. In the United States, torrential rains drenched much of greater Miami, leaving cars stranded and forcing the closure of schools and Fort Lauderdale Airport until at least Friday. The National Weather Service said the downpour on Wednesday dumped 635 millimeters of rain in 24 hours on Fort Lauderdale, a coastal city of 180,000 people. That was almost twice the amount of water that set the previous record in 1979. The city declared a state of emergency and asked people to be patient as it worked to reopen flooded roads. Forecasters warned of possible flooding in metropolitan Miami because more rain was forecast for Friday and the ground is already soaked. We live in this street and everything is flooded. We live more than 40 years and never happened. So we have like uh, 14 inches inside the house, everywhere, up to the bed. And uh, it's unfortunate, but, but we have each other. <laughs> we're, we're renters, so thank God, you know, and I feel bad for our homeowner. Yeah, he's been great through this, um, but our plan of action is to evacuate. We can't stay in there, E. coli risks, all that. Literal poop in the water, you know, can't live in there. In the United States, the FBI have arrested a 21-year-old Air National Guardsman in Massachusetts suspected of being responsible for the leak of U.S. classified defense documents. Jog Tixera was arrested at his home in the town of North Dickton by FBI agents. In Washington, the U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland confirmed the arrest, saying Tixera was being held in connection with an investigation into alleged and authorized removal, retention, and transmission of classified national defense information. Information. Texera is believed to have been the leader of an online chat group where hundreds of photographs of secret and top secret documents were first uploaded. The materials, allegedly made by the Pentagon and the U.S. Special Services in February and March, focus on issues such as the approximate losses suffered by Ukraine and Russia since the conflict broke out, the weapons and equipment that Kiev will need in the future. Former U.S. President Donald Trump is appearing in court for the second time on Thursday in a fraud lawsuit led by New York Attorney General Letitia James. After appearing last week in Manhattan for a 34-count felony arrangement, the mogul returned to court for a case in which he is accused, along with his three adult children and his business entities, of manipulating property values to obtain investment and loan proceeds over several years. Trump offered his first deposition in this civil fraud lawsuit against August, or last August, but invoked the Fifth Amendment more than 400 times, and it is now unclear whether he will answer questions, according to reports by The Hill and the CBS News. The state of New York is seeking $250 million in financial penalties and asks the court to prohibit the former president and Donald Jr., Ivanka and Eric Trump from serving as officers or directors in any corporation, register or license in that state. 
Charles for English continues to grow. You can now tune in from 33 different African countries using StarSat. Dial 461 and enjoy our Latin American alternative broadcast. One final short break and we'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. In Yemen, the Houthi and Sarullah movement and the Arab coalition led by Saudi Arabia started on Friday an exchange of almost 900 prisoners of war as part of the negotiation process to end the conflict. Hundreds of relatives gathered outside Zenai International Airport to welcome the released prisoners from Aden. The International Committee of the Red Cross specified that the prisoners' swap will last three days and that there will be simultaneous runs of flights between Aden, controlled by the Saudi coalition, and Zana controlled by the Houthi and Sarullah movement. The release of prisoners comes after delegations from Saudi Arabia and Oman arrived in Yemen this week to hold talks with militias. On Thursday, Italy vowed a host of investment in Tunisia and helped negotiations on International Monetary Fund bailout, as Rome seeks to stabilize the North African country's economic crisis and stem the increased number of migrants coming to the European nation. Foreign Minister Antonio Tujani outlined Italy's efforts and pledges during a meeting with his Tunisian counterpart, Nabil Ammar, who insisted that Tunisia has seen growing numbers of African migrants arriving from the Libyan border and needs economic help. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development says Tunisia is experiencing its worst crisis in a generation, with inflation hovering around 11 percent and food increasingly scarce. The government is negotiating a $2 billion to $4 billion loan with the IMF to cope with a budget deficit aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Sudan's military warned on Thursday of potential clashes with the country's powerful paramilitary force, which it said deployed troops in the capital and other cities. The military said in a statement that the build-up of the Rapid Support Forces, or the RSF, in Khartoum and elsewhere in the country had come without approval or coordination with the armed forces leadership. The note said the RSF's measures have stirred up panic and fear among people, exacerbated security risks, and increased tensions between regular forces. The military informs it has attempted to find peaceful solutions to such violations to prevent an armed conflict with the RSF. The opposition between the chairman of the Sudanese ruling junta, General Al-Burhan, and his deputy general De Gallo, who leads the rapid support forces, has brought the transition to civilians to a standstill. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesorienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesor English, I'm Lorenco Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.